We ready? Right. Okay. Got it. What going on? Going live on YouTube should be up in just a couple seconds. Yeah. We are live on YouTube. Okay, just give us one minute uh, to We're having a bit of we're, technical we're, uh, moment. We're live on our website, so we can start whenever we're ready. Sure, right. thank you. All righty. Good evening, everyone. I want to thank uh, each and every one of you for joining us, our chairpersons and staff who are on the call, including uh, council members and their staff as well. I want to first welcome and congratulate our new chairperson for Community Board 11, Paul De, De Benito. I'm going to try to make sure I don't mess this up. De Benito. Be Di Benedetto. You got it the last time. Thank you. Di Benedetto, <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, got it. <laughs> congratulations. Thank you, Borough President. Thank you so much. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Congratulations to any of the new uh, uh, community board members listening in today. Of course, look forward to swearing y'all in soon. And Paul, we look forward to all of the great hard work and leadership that you will provide at CB11. Um, so tonight, we're going to jump right into our agenda. agenda. Tonight, we are pleased to be joined by the New York City Department of City Planning and Founders Entertainment. For our first presentation, we will hear from our frequent visitors from DCP. Tonight, we will be there will be a joint presentation from DCP's Planning Support and Community Planning and Civic Engagement Divisions. These divisions will discuss the agency's evolving community board engagement work, including an overview of community district needs in the FY24 analysis. DCP will also inform the board of their civic engagement studio strategies for community board partnerships. Here to present on behalf of DCP is civic engagement associate Siobhan Jackson and planning support analyst Tashina Wright. We welcome Siobhan and Tashina tonight to kick us off. Need one more second, Siobhan's just going back to her desk. <laughs> oh, no problem. Oh, okay, no problem. <laughs> and thank you so much, President Richards, for having us. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. No problem. Tasha, you ready? Um, yes, Siobhan's going to her desk. See, Siobhan is at a desk. I'm back. <laughs> All right, awesome. All righty, you may begin. Oh, thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. 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 Okay, great. Thank you very much. So, just a little introduction. Hello, everyone. I am Siobhan Jackson. And I am joined here today with my colleagues in the Community Planning and Engagement Division, Lara Marita, who is our Senior Director, Elizabeth Hamby, our Director, Connie Chen, our Assistant Director, and our Agency's Plan and Support Division. And the individual who I'll be facilitating today's discussion with is Tashina Buffalo Wright. Um, a little bit about my journey at City Planning. I've been with the agency for a little over seven years and I am new to the community planning and engagement division. My core role as engagement specialist is to build relationships, partnership development, and develop a shared understanding and resources for communities. We will be doing this work with the Queensboro uh, director, Alexis Wheeler, the deputy director, Jonathan Keller, and the Queensboro planners who I know you all have worked closely with, with community district needs processes and evolving with community board engagement and other work that city planning has, uh, projects that we work on here. 
Um, today, I will give you an overview of the Community Planning and Engagement Division, and I will introduce you to the Sipping Engagement Studio, which is a program that is tied into the division. And one of the components of that, of that program is our outreach for community board partnerships and finding strategies to support and making residents aware of the community board's presence in their neighborhoods, as well as the importance of in their involvement in the community district needs. And later, Tashina will talk to you a little bit about the importance of investing in the, in the community district needs. Some of you may have already heard of the Community Planning and Engagement Division. Um, it was announced uh, by our commissioner, Dan, uh, Dan Garodnik here at City Planning. Uh, so who are we and what role do we play in community outreach? The Community Planning and Engagement Division was developed to foster innovation and add capacity to build tools and skills for the whole agency. We are extending our outreach by collaborating with community boards, civic associations, and other city agencies like we're doing here today. And we're also focusing on creating holistic community plans that advance the priorities of New Yorkers and work on developing new ways to bring people to the table and including them in robust decision-making processes. City planning has recognized the need to incorporate community engagement in the work we do to advance our community engagement efforts with projects that will affect the communities we represent. We've done this through our neighborhood studies projects which serve as the center for DCP's coordinated neighborhood planning work. As some of you may have known, in June, the Mayor Adams has announced the City of Yes projects, which is the New York City's plans to modernize and update our city zoning regulations to support small businesses, create affordable housing, and promote sustainability. Our carbon neutrality, which will support city plan carbon reduction, and then the reduction of other greenhouse emissions by enabling clean, clean energy. We will talk more about that later about this proposal um, in April on April 24th, which is the Monday after Earth Day. So back to the community planning and engagement division. We recognize that the need to broaden its engagement practices and develop the and we developed the civic engagement studio. The studio was is a centered as an internal way to support the agency. We work to transform these ways with stakeholders to shape and advance policies and increase transparency and trust, acknowledging that there are things that we can do better and evaluate our partnerships and community engagement. The studio is looking for new ideas and is welcoming to hearing from community boards. The studio is made up of several work streams that support in innovating the way we listen to and learn with communities by developing new tools to improve the effectiveness, inclusiveness, and equity of our engagement strategies. Two of our key work streams have come out of the studio and they're highlighted here today, which is our youth engagement work stream. The youth engagement work stream was established to build connections between DCP planners and the educational community in order to increase civic engagement in young people. <laughs> City planning is in collaboration with the Laboratory School of Finance and Technology in the Bronx, where we created and implemented an urban planning pilot program for high school seniors. Students there learned about urban planning, urban decisions, and how decisions get made that impact their neighborhood. They also developed their own proposals to enhance the quality of life in their neighborhood while developing the skills to be civic leaders and advocates in their, in their communities. Our other work stream is the Broaden and Diversify Community Input, or as we call it here, BDCI which is one of the reasons why we're having this discussion with you guys today. This work stream was created to evaluate um, community perspectives and decision-making in, in the statement of needs process. Also, while diversifying community perspectives represented in our annual submissions, making sure that there's equitable access to the process for everyone. The 
The BDCI Workstream wanted to work with community boards to develop the best engagement approach. The plan, the plan that the Workstream developed allowed city planning to build recommendations that identified the needs in community boards. We began this process first internally, where we surveyed our planners and gathered an overview that address ways to evaluate current conditions in communities, including how our planners were perceived by other city agencies, and also the understanding between the community boards and the planners before, during, and after the, com the community district needs process. After we've collected the data, the work stream began the outreach process externally, and we started to schedule interviews with community boards. We were able to conduct 21 community board interviews throughout this process within the five boroughs. These interviews were intended to develop an outline of the community board's approach for the community district needs process. This included their community engagement strategies and if there were any resources needed to gain more input from city planning or other agencies, whether that was through training or other workshops. We want to let you all know we were listening. The interviews with, that we held with the community boards were candid and the district managers and chairs that we spoke with, they were pleased that we were having these conversations around the importance of the community district needs and engaging in the community in the process. Also being aware that most residents were not quite familiar with their community boards or the roles that they played in their neighborhood. So we wanted to focus on those opportunities to make folks aware and, and let them know that their community boards were important and that they should get involved in these community district needs process as it benefits their neighborhoods. The remainder of the year, the work stream went through each interview and developed a strategy that helped focus on groupings or similar ideas. And once we collected that information, we we group them into different narratives, focusing on key concepts that provide that we were provided from the community boards. The five concepts became online support, language support, in-person support, campaign support, and training support tools. And as you can see here, I've highlighted some of the recommendations that the agency has already started to work on since we collected the feedback. The work stream is working towards developing a community planning survey and multilingual use, and also incre increasing our engagement through social media and providing community member training. Last March, our agency has provided trainings that included zoning, EULER, seeker, community district needs, and also principles on urban, urban design. We're currently looking to bring back those two-day trainings this year in the fall. We want to continue to better our strategy methods and to gain an overview of the community district needs process. And over this last year, we've done that. As I've mentioned earlier, we're working on developing a multilingual use survey and in order to provide a better variety of perspectives and the conversations that we're having. We also continue our outreach on social media. And last year, our agency did a push to communities that was released on Twitter, encouraging folks to get involved on the community boards and, and also their involvement in the community district needs. We're also looking for other ways to increase our outreach and we're working on strategies to use linked NYC as a place to network with communities as well. And I wanna say thank you very much and I will turn it over to Sashina, who I mentioned earlier, will talk to you all about the importance of investing in community district needs. Good evening. Thank you, Siobhan, for that lovely introduction. And thank you all for joining us today. I'm accompanied by members of our planning support team, Stephen Everett, the Director of Planning Support here at DCP, Nick Sampar, Analyst, Ben Lee, our Housing Fellow. I am Tashina and I'm new to city planning. I recently started a little over a month ago. My role here with Planning Support is to work closely with the community districts and advocate for the needs of the 59 community boards. I'd like to share our new approach as we work with civic engagement to improve the community district need process. Our purpose, investing in the value of community district needs. 
we aim to make community district needs as valuable as possible for boards and agencies alike, delivering useful insight and concrete outcomes. This is the city's most direct community-based budgeting initiative. It is an invaluable resource for turning public input into action. We are doing this by encouraging trust and dialogue. Informing agencies, we create a direct line of communication from the community districts and stakeholders to inform the agencies of what they need and how it can be budgeted for. Considering community perspectives through equity lens, this gives the community their opportunity to tell their stories of what is needed in their neighborhoods. Summarizing community perspectives to City Hall. Next slide, please. Thank you. Your feedback is appreciated. Feedback from our community board partners is a central pillar in our approach to enhancing the community district need process. We need to continue to receive your feedback so as to continue to develop stronger partnerships with community boards, provide access to resources, Avoiding community engagement, fixing technical issues. We know that technical issues can be an obstacle. However, we are improving the website and it will be available next year, 2024. And improving transparency in regards to agency responses. Next um, slide, please. We hear you. We aim to enhance the utility of the CD needs process and invest in the value it offers our community through four party areas. First, we are updating the calendar by opening the submission form in June to give community boards more time for the submission process. Also, the community district needs submission platform replacement. We are working on replacing the submission tool to make it easier and we will be collaborating with community boards to develop the new submission website. In addition, community board support menu. We are expanding our community board support starting in May to give more submission help to the boards and policy priorities to improve community district need outcome. By reducing the number of neutral responses, we are working with the agencies to receive more clear and direct responses less ambiguous responses so as to help facilitate with the next fiscal request. Next slide, please. Thanks. Ongoing. Your continued partnership is crucial to improving the community district process. Continue to give us your feedback regarding the submission process and what we can do to assist in your collection of public input. Continue asking community board members to volunteer to help test and develop our new online submission platform and continue to talk to people and spread the word. We welcome, next slide. We welcome your feedback. If you have any questions, please contact our DCP team. But now we want to take any follow-up questions that you all may have on any component of this presentation. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I guess I have one question. So obviously you, you assess and take in all of this information on community needs, right? And you know, I'm very appreciative of the work uh, and the, la the labor of love you put in and in, in coming up with the statement of community district needs. What is the follow-up? Like what is the interagency follow-up? So we assess these needs do, are there any agencies who go through this and actually say, okay, here are 15 items in this community board that need to be addressed? And are there any agencies who are looking to address these, these issues proactively outside of us having to advocate for them on all 14 community boards? So I just, just wanted to hear a little bit more about the long game. It's okay if historically that has not been done, but is that something this administration is looking to do, I guess, moving into the future. 
Um, thank you. For uh, yeah, yeah, I can I can step in and take that one, Tash. Um, okay. Hey, uh, my name is Nick. Um, I'm an analyst on the planning support team and our current lead for the CD needs process. Um, so the age, interagency follow up is actually the part of the calendar that we're in right now. So following the uh, boards submitting their district statement of needs and community board budget requests in the fall, um, we first send out reports to agencies that are responding to those budget requests to summarize, um, sort of stripping away the content that's not relevant to their specific agency's work. Um, so that they have kind of more concise reports on exactly what community boards are requesting and outlining as their needs and challenges as it relates to that agency's specific uh, work program. And then in the spring, we're in the midst of going through uh, our agency roadshow process where we compile specific analytics about the submissions and budget requests um, and go to each agency and do a presentation, have a discussion about uh, what trends and analysis we were able to pull out of the previous year's submission process. So um, we're going to, we're doing about 35 roadshows over the course of uh, March through May, leading up to the opening of next year's form. Uh, and so we will be having continuing to have these discussions with agencies, not only about uh, sort of the trends that we took away from the last year's submissions, but also how we can work more closely with those agencies to sort of improve upon the outcomes from last year as we move into the next cycle. And how that information disseminated to government partners and, you know, obviously the community boards as well. So you check off, I don't know, this stretch of a boulevard that needed to be repaved. And, you know, obviously that came through the work between you and the interagency coordination, how that information reported back or their place on the website where we would be able to go and say, OK, this, this was an issue this year. Check. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, the community board budget requests all sort of nearly 4,000 of them from uh, the city's 59 community boards. Those get responded to by a deadline of December 15th every year by the agencies. And then when OMB's new budget register comes out in the new year for the preliminary city's preliminary budget, uh, those agency responses to the budget requests are included in the budget register. And then this year, for the first time, we're excited to announce that we have included all of those agency responses also tacked on to the back and the appendix of each community board's individual uh, district need statement. So our community district profiles tool online that you can access through the DCP website uh, will allow you to kind of click around to different districts and you can look through all sorts of information about your districts. And then in the community board tab, we have the last three consecutive years of district need statements housed there. So you can kind of compare over years. And then this most recent years will have uh, what each agency said to each request in the final section of those reports. All right. Thank you. That's my only question. But uh, thank you. And that, that's good. That's good to know that you'll definitely have that. And I am deeply appreciative because um, I, I just remember going through a lot of this information when I was a city council staffer at that and obviously council member. But, you know, the, the community needs assessment was really helpful on trends around at least my district then. But obviously, I got to look at all 14 community boards now. So I want to thank you for the work that you all do put into this. I'll go to Chair Orr first for questions. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. Within uh, Queens County, what community boards did you have interviews with? Um, we actually, Queens, we interviewed four community boards in, in Queens, in the Queens area. Okay, and what boards were those? So I will bring those up. You can get back to me. Mm -hmm. You can get back to me on that. Um, there was a time, and <clears throat> maybe Betty or <clears throat> somebody else that's uh, been on the board longer than I, there was a time after we came up with our <clears throat> community needs that the agencies used to meet with, at the very least, the district manager, never the full board, but with the district manager to discuss why we have this request. And there was that interaction. And I don't believe that's taking place anymore. And why would that be if we're looking to get people more engaged? 
Um, sure. Yeah, I can take this one. Uh, we have heard this complaint from a lot of district managers. We, we absolutely share this uh, concern with you because one of our priorities in trying to deliver better outcomes through this process to community boards is making sure that those follow-up discussions, that we are able to close the loop on those discussions. There are some requests that get responses that maybe aren't full sort of end of the road, you know, easy to check off kind of thing. And we want to make sure that there are those follow-up discussions. So right now we are, um, we just spoke with a number of district managers in Manhattan last week and are uh, planning on uh, having similar conversations around the other boroughs uh, to gather more input and include that input in the conversations that we're having as we go around to the agencies to try to follow up on that. But one of our priorities in those conversations with agencies is to amplify the concerns we've heard from community boards about how these conversations are not linking up. And then ideally um, as a facilitator, sort of step in and help make those connections. You know, if, if a district manager isn't quite sure who the right contact person is at an agency for this request, you know, we might be able to help as a sister agency in identifying that person and making that connection so that that, that discussion can happen. Right. But I don't believe the district manager should be chasing the agencies. I think there should be, and with Zoom, it's easy enough to have uh, virtual meetings to go through the comments from the different agencies. And perfect example is we either in community board 14, flood zone one, Superstorm Sandy, and we have uh, 30 blocks that have, there's no storm sewers. And they've turned us down on storm sewers. They said they're not necessary, even though they're right across the street from the beach. So we shouldn't be, have to chase that agency. It should be part of their requirement to engage um, from, with the at least the district manager is my opinion. That's the way it used to be done. Thank and we you. completely agree. Okay, and then just whenever somebody has to follow up to let us know what community boards in uh, Queens were interviewed. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Orr. We'll go to Chair Bratton. Thank you, Mr. Bar, Bar President. Uh, thank you for the presentation. You know, to kind of follow up a little bit on what Dolores is saying. You know, one of the weaknesses from the perspective of community boards looking at the responses is that many of our budget requests are things that are in our budget requests year after year after year. And we don't get an answer other than, you know, oh, when budget uh, monies are available, we'll look at it. You know, not a particularly responsive answer. The other thing that's problematic is we will oftentimes at the borough budget consultations with the different agencies, we will ask the local agency people, what would they think is something we need to put a budget request in? We'll make a budget request based upon what the agency has asked us to ask for, and we'll get a nonsensical answer. You know, basically saying, Talk to the agency. You know, the agency asked us to put it in there. You know, we need to get better responses. So, you know, that's just my two cents. You know, it, it's, it's a good thing to engage people in the process. But people are going to get engaged and then they get as frustrated as we get over the fact that things don't get accomplished. You know, we ask for what we ask for. The needs are there. Almost anything that we ask for in our needs, someone in the community has asked us to include that, and it doesn't get done. So, you know, that's where the process is failing, in my you know, opinion. So uh, that's about all I've got to say for today on this. And I agree with that. And there has been progress on some. So I would be lying if there were things that were not checked off the checklist, per se. But I know just respecting history before I came in here for a fact that there are things that have been on some of these community boards lists going back 40 years. So Betty is not, <laughs> you know, being cynical. It's just that if we're going to go through these processes and get the public engaged, we need to have clear deliverables to be able to go back to them. So that, that was my point in raising the question earlier. How are we really doing some real interagency work in coordination to make sure that we're checking those things off the list that 
or on the list. I'll be 40 Sunday. <laughs> you know, <laughs> some of these things have been on the list. for 40. They've been on their list for 40 years. So, yeah. But uh, thank you for that, uh, Chair Brayden. Uh, we're going to go to Chair Dimitriot Beer Dimitriotis. Did I get that right? That's perfectly good. Thank you so much. <laughs> And I'm actually very excited to see that we're going to be focusing on this and looking to improve it because I have to say it is very frustrating year upon year to get stuff that says require study. And then you put in that we're going to study the problem and they're like, well, we have to wait and see. And it's like, well, you totally we require study. So I'm very excited to see that we're putting some efforts in this. A couple of things that would help to the point of how long things sit on our lists. It would be helpful if we could have a, an apparatus to actually track the aging of a, of a, of a budget priority um, so that we can see how long it's been on there, you know, what the year was and how long so that it makes us, it makes us, gives us a visual reminder of how long we've been waiting for something. We're finally going to break ground in 2024 on a library that we've been talking about in my district since 1994. Um, so to give you an example of like, if we could have seen that that would have, I think, maybe created a bigger sense of urgency. Um, the other thing that we get a lot of questions about when we do our budget priorities is the fact that we get more um, room for expense request, um, for expense request, I mean, sorry, less room for expense requests than we get for capital. And for instance, our district would benefit from a little more opportunity to put an additional expense requests. So it would be interesting to see if that is something down the road that we could look at. And the last thing I would like to ask, and I've asked several times is, and I love those community district profiles. They are very helpful, but they are wicked outdated. It is 2010 census data. It is 2023. Um, I know I asked a year ago when we had city planning and it was going to get taken care of and we, we're all in a catching upness of life from COVID and I get that. So if we could get those updated, it really helps inform our perspective of how our districts have changed. Um, and I know that mine has, and I can go in and pull data from other places because I played around with census stuff, but most people don't know where to get that information from. And if we've got this really hot tool, that it, it'll make it even hotter if it's equipped with the most current data. So I'm very thankful um, to do this. And um, I would love to talk to you all offline um, to share with you sort of what our process looks like in six, because we actually have a public engagement process that we've been doing now. We'll be in our second year this year. Um, but thank you so much for your work on this and um, love to kind of see how this keeps progressing. We would certainly love to have a follow-up conversation to talk about this more. I appreciate that. Yeah. All right. Any other questions, comments, or concerns on this item? All right, Reverend uh, Princess Thorbs. Good evening. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, happy Holy Week. My um, my ask is around the lines of what Miss Betty Branton has already said and what um, Miss Dolores Orr. Can we have items that have been on, and we're the district community board twelve. We're the ones that have. I have a list from 47 years ago. Can you um, also assist us with the language as to, you know, how are the, what other ways are we, are we saying it wrong? Is it being put in incorrectly? What's the wording that you need to make something get done and not continue to be on the list for 47 years? I would be happy to take this one. It's very nice to see you again, Chair Reverend Thorpes. Uh, and Hi, Stephen. I'm the hey. director of planning support here. Um, and to, uh, to put a fine point on it, DCP does not choose, or, nor do we, uh, nor are we involved in the agency's um, selection of which, which budget requests to fund. So it is not that we need a certain type of language, but we do offer community board support ahead of the deadline process to make sure that the budget requests are written in, uh, in such a way that the agencies would be able to understand them. So we would be happy to meet with you after this to look at those that have been on your list for a longer period of time and speak with you and that agency 
to find out whether they would be able to fund it in a coming cycle. But it is not just the language of the budget request that matters. It is also uh, due to agency funding and administrative priorities. So we'd be happy to talk more with you after this. Okay. And Thank I'm going to be bold here in saying that, um, you know, also cross coordination with council members, with us, with, with other local elected officials, also that coordination is critical because even as we negotiate a budget, we go in and advocate. And I can assure you, you know, we look at your list, we look at your parks, we look at your libraries, you know, it really does help inform us in a way on what the priorities are, knowing that money's not limitless here, like we got to prioritize, uh, money's not unlimited. But but the bottom line is, you know, making sure that that coordination is there as well. So I think we can also do a better job at strengthening that, that this particular issue, on this particular issue as well, so as we go in to advocate for the mayor, with the mayor and others, we all are in sync and rowing in one direction with whomever represents your respective districts in, on certain areas. So I won't put that totally on DCP because we also do a lot of advocacy too on our part. And sometimes we get that answer too. We've been doing okay recently, but but you know we still have a lot of work to do to check a lot of these things um, off the list. So I just wanted to also put that out there as well and also offer that olive branch to DCP as well in terms of figuring out maybe using Borough Hall as a place where we gather the agencies and the board together and really sit down at the table and get to work on what are some issues that we want to see addressed, you know, holistically as a borough. So I'm just throwing that, that, that out there as well. I work as year round, 365 advocacy, but I think some more coordination may go a long way here as well with us also pulling the agencies in. More more work for the staff certainly, but um, but some, maybe something we can consider doing on a yearly basis with the agencies as well. Um, I'll go to Jean Kelty for the last question on this. Hi, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Barrow President. Uh, one uh, to my counterpart in Ward Six, there is a tracking code on the budget. It tells you that when this thing was submitted, it is. It says it on the OMB board when we get the budget things. It tells you there's a tracking code how long it's been sitting in the code. And, and it is very frustrating, as you said, Heather, that it sits for 2019, 2018. Then all of a sudden you see something like in 1987 it was submitted, like how the heck did it get stuck that long? <clears throat> so <clears throat> there is a tracking. Maybe they do a little better what they should talk about us. But I find that the answer that OMB throws at us in those budget books <laughs> and the people in the budget books, Mr. Borough President, annoys the living hell out of me. They give us contact people and we're trying to get our budget together. And I do it every year only because trying to pass it on to one of my other board members to do this is a nightmare. So I've been doing it for, I would say, the last 10 years, 15 years. And I leave messages for people like in the police department. They never call me back. I leave messages for DOT. Never call me back. And then I have to go after my local people all the time. So city planning is always there. And I appreciate what they do. But O&B and the contact people that put those books together for us doesn't seem to care. It's a nice name having a name in it, but nobody answers the phone. And I'm getting tired of the pandemic. They're going to use that for the next 20 years that the pandemic caused all these problems. And it's time to wake up and let's get back to reality. And, and it is frustrating that we have all these things sitting for 14, 18, 22 years. And if the agency doesn't want to move it, the, I could stand there and do cartwheels and the agency is not moving. They send it back to us. Our agency doesn't recommend it at this time, like Betty's talking about it. Then the other one was needs further study by the borough, by the borough agency head. Well, why don't they send, send it to the damn borough agency head? Why are they sending it back to me? That should have been done by them and OMP should have sent that over to them and moved the process along. That's where it's being held up. And city planning is not is the least of the problem to us. They're always there, and they always provide support for us. It's the uh, OMB is the linchpin that causes all this by letting it get stonewalled with the agency's stupid answers back to us with with incomplete information. And and that's the hardest thing that we have, Mr. Borough President. I'm doing it 39 years, and it's frustrating. I sit there with the books, and I feel like that movie, The Day the Races, with the Marx Brothers. I got 27 books trying to get answers, and it's only the one person has the answer, and they never pick up the phone to talk to us. That's the problem. Well, the mere fact that you endorse the Department of City Planning says that y'all are doing something right. Um, <laughs> that's a big and that's that's a better endorsement than I could ever give, by the way. Dean Kelty endorses says you're consistent in there. That says a lot about your agency. Um, but in, but in, in all seriousness, if you do have those issues, 
we need to know that because then we can, you know, we can alert one, um, the mayor's office to that because they can also pull in the agencies. So none of y'all should be struggling to really get in touch with any agencies. And if you have that challenge, that's something Maricela should get so that we know and we can, you know, we can elevate it. And although we shouldn't really have to, quite frankly, but if that is the case, we need to know that. But I think I think the idea I floated on maybe having a yearly or, or, or biannual meeting with all the agencies with us, because we all go through this dance every year where we come up with the assessment needs. We do the budget hearing, but I think something that's more of a working meeting you know, it's a lot of y'all, you're going to have a lot of needs. So we can't go through all hundred of your needs or nine, 4,000 of them, but maybe thinking about bringing your, your top four priorities or whatever it is for each board and really sitting um, at Borough Hall and having that meeting with DCP and the agency so we can break through some of the bureaucracy may be a good idea. So that, that's where my mind went today. And uh, we will look forward to doing that, uh, Khalil and, and Maricela. And uh, Borough President, if I could just um, just um, answer the question. Um, so we were able to interview uh, Queens 5 and uh, 10, and I think we had to reschedule uh, Q12 and 14. So those were the community boards in Queens. I just wanted to make sure I address that. Okay. Well, if you said you were doing 14, you better not disappoint Dolores. <laughs> Dolores going to be like, wait, I checked the I messages. Know. I ain't getting no call. <laughs> She's being kind to y'all today. So you just make sure that that happens if you're going to throw them out there. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank y'all for, for being here. Uh, thank you once again. I really did. And I, in all honesty, like I said, I used to look forward to seeing the updates on the assessment needs for the community boards. Um, and I uh, look forward to seeing them now uh, as they get updated again. So look forward to the continued work and thank you for reaching out to us even without a rezoning or something coming, which is great being proactive. So I appreciate that. Please give my uh, regards to uh, uh, Chairman Garadnik as well. All right, thank, thank you. All right, we're gonna move on now to our second presentation. Uh, we are joined tonight by co-founder of Founders Entertainment, Tom Russell. Tom is also joined by his colleagues, Jen Stiles and Chelsea Gamara. Jen is the head of festivals at Founders while Chelsea serves as a festival manager. Tonight, they will be talking and introducing Governor's Ball 2023 and discussing the event details pertaining to their move to our wonderful Flushing Meadows Corona Park. And uh, I have been attending Governor's Ball at least since I've been VP. Uh, at City Field, really exciting. So it is going to be really interesting to see it now move into the park this year. And certainly we look forward to continuing to work with you and all of our agency partners to make sure uh, that this goes off, uh, you know, successfully and so that you can be back. <laughs> so so as I've said to them, just so y'all know, chairs, like we don't got a choice but to get this right, because this is going to be the first festival, I think, in Flushing Meadows Corona in like a very long time. Um, so this does have borough-wide impacts um, from an economy standpoint, um, and we want to make sure that all of Queens is aware of what's happening in our backyard. All right. So, uh, Tom, you may take it from here. Thank you, Borough President, and very nice to see everyone this evening. Uh, I put together a brief deck that I'll walk everybody through that gives you a little bit of info on the festival, its history, uh, some details on this year's event, as well as our uh, community engagement plan. Uh, so let me share my screen here. Um, all right, is everybody seeing this? Yes. All right. Uh, all right, so we're here this evening to talk about the Governor's Ball Music Festival, uh, which this year will take place on June 9, 10, and 11 in beautiful Flushing Meadows Corona Park. For those that are not familiar, uh, the festival has been around since 2011 and is truly NYC's homegrown music festival. I was born and raised in New York City, started going to concerts uh, at a very young age and just fell in love with live music. And as I started out a career in the music industry, always wondered why New York City didn't have a perennial music festival that the city could rally around and call its own. While cities like Chicago, Austin, Texas, San Francisco, they all had big music events. 
So um, we broke off from our respective companies, my business partners and I, and we started GovBall in 2011. And since then, it's grown to become um, the biggest music festival in New York City's entertainment landscape. It features um, four stages or three stages of music across three days, and it always takes place in June, typically the first or second weekend. This year's performers include Kendrick Lamar, Lizzo, Odessa, Lil Nas X, Lil Baby, Haim, and a slew of others. Past performers include Kings of Leon, Drake, so, so, so many more, covering rock, hip hop, pop, R&B, folk, what have you. Beyond the music, we showcase what's best of New York. That includes local restaurants, visual artists, and of course, nonprofits. The event's ethos is truly all New York City. We attract people from all over the city, the country, and the world. Over the past 11 years, over 1.3 million people have attended GovBall, and annually, half of the people usually come from in-state and half from out-of-state. We've garnered some great press over the years from publications such as the New York Times, Variety, Rolling Stone, and as you can see, um, we've been uh, very, very lucky, and people definitely recognize how New York City, our event and ethos really is. This year, as the BP mentioned, we will be moving to Flushing Meadows Corona Park, which is really, really exciting for us. Over the years, we have been on Governor's Island. That was our first year. It was a one-day event back in 2011. Then we went to Randall's Island for many years, and that's where we became the larger model that we are today. Um, after the pandemic, we moved to City Field, and we loved being in Queens, and we loved the reception we got to it, loved the accessibility, and uh, what was really missing from the past few years at City Field was green space. Music festivals and festivals in general are just so much different when they're surrounded by trees and shade and just a beautiful setting. So we were very, very um, lucky to uh, have been chosen by the Parks Department and the City uh, to take place this year in the park. And um, we will get into a lot of details on that shortly. Um, before I do that, I'll show the lineup here for those music lovers. Um, many of these acts uh, cover hip hop, pop, R&B, uh, but there's really something for everyone. If you like electronic music, if you like K-pop, uh, you name the genre, we probably feature it in some way or another. Um, with the move to the park comes a slew of park and community benefits. Um, these benefits include massive economic benefits. Uh, we've done economic impact studies that show that annually we bring in over $75 million plus in economic impact. Um, we always support nonprofits and we always have a massive PR and marketing campaign that highlights both the festival, the venue, and the city. As it relates to economic impacts, uh, those impacts include to the park itself. Um, rental fees will go to Flushing Meadows and the New York City Parks Department. Those rental fees will help fund capital projects and maintain park maintenance. Uh, we also anticipate a lot of increased foot traffic throughout the park and the immediate areas. This foot traffic will be great for local restaurants, hotels, and surrounding businesses. Um, and there's also a ton of employment opportunities at the festival. Uh, we work with multiple unions, we work with a slew of different vendors, many of which are local, um, and it's a three-day massive music festival, and many, many jobs are created through the, uh, through the project. Here's a uh, little flash of the last economic impact report that we ran. Um, it shows 507 full-time job equivalents, over $33 million in labor income, $5.4 million to state and local tax revenue, um, $14 plus million to restaurants, $5 plus million to hotels, $6 plus million to transit and transportation. This most recent study was done by a firm called Angelou Economics based in Texas. They have done a number of economic impact studies for music festivals and events around the country. I mentioned global PR and exposure. Um, we have an amazing marketing team and PR team that helps amplify what we do, both before the event and at the event. 
Um, as you can see here, there are millions upon millions of impressions um, globally. Uh, we have tons of coverage in press. We typically do a live stream each year, which shows off the festival, the borough, the venue, et cetera, uh, to people all over the world. Uh, we also, of course, have a direct impact on hotels and restaurants in the immediate area and the city as a whole. People come far and wide for the festival. Over 25 countries people have traveled from over the years. Typically, uh, that changes with the talent that we have. For example, when we had Jay Balvin a couple of years ago, we had a lot of people from Colombia. Um, this year, we're seeing uh, typically, uh, it's pretty standard that half the people are coming from in-state, half from out-of-state. Uh, we do have people coming from London, Mexico, France, um, all over, and uh, it will only start to get um, even bigger as we get closer. Nonprofit support is a huge part of what we do. Uh, we have an annual program we run called GovBall Gives Back. This is our CSR program, which supports important causes and organizations through fundraising, community service, and amplification. Over the years, we've donated over $100,000 to local and national nonprofits. Past beneficiaries have included Answer the Call, which is the Police and Fire Widows Fund, Every Town for Gun Safety, Planned Parenthood, and the Mayor's Fund to Advance New York City. The times we donated to the Mayor's Fund, it was because of events that happened that really touched closely to the festival. Years ago, there was a building explosion in East Harlem uh, that we donated to the Mayor's Fund uh, to help the victims with. And there was also the fire in, um, in Queens that we donated money for. So, um, you know, we always try to give back as much as we can financially. Um, but we also do so with time and labor. We run uh, a community service program where fans can put their hours and work toward a free ticket to the event. Um, so about 5,000 hours annually um, are done through this program. Uh, past beneficiaries of this volunteer community service initiative uh, are the Food Bank for New York, the New York Common Pantry, and the Randalls Island Park Alliance. Uh, in addition to contributions and financial and community service, we also allow nonprofits to come to the event and um, expose their brand, their cause to, uh, to attendees, many of whom have never heard of them before. We've had organizations such as Headcount, the Equal Justice Initiative, UNHCR, Union Settlement, Make-A-Wish, and many others at the event. Um, and people do whatever they want to do in their booth. Uh, we leave it up to the uh, the nonprofit, whether it's um, a drive to raise awareness or a raffle or giveaways or fundraising, um, we just give them the opportunity to be there to show off their cause and to get people excited to uh, to help and learn more about them. Um, a number of things that we're doing this year uh, benefit the local community, uh, and I want to talk a little bit more about that. Um, we're offering discounted tickets to local residents. If you live in the following zip codes, 11368, 11355, 11375, and 11367, we are offering you discounted tickets to the event. Um, those zip codes were specifically chosen because they border the park and the area that the festival is gonna be in. Um, this year's nonprofit partners are the Elmhurst Corona Resource Collaborative and Shia CDC. Uh, these are two incredible local organizations that will benefit in the ways that I mentioned earlier. We will be running a, um, a fundraising drive through a festival partner of ours called Propeller, and people can earn the, or they can basically donate for a chance to win tickets at the event. Uh, they can also volunteer their time uh, with the nonprofit um, so they don't have to pay for a ticket, they can just work for it. Um, these organizations will also have a place at the festival where they can show off um, their organization and what they do. Um, and our conversations with both of them have been really exciting because they're super excited and we're super excited. And we think it's a great opportunity to not just fundraise for them, but also show them off to a ton of people who frankly aren't familiar with them. Um, lastly, but not least, we have launched a scholarship program this year with an organization called Music Forward Initiative. Um, this program will award a local Queen student with a $10,000 scholarship. Um, in addition, on the education front, we are uh, we booked the School of Rock Queens and the School of Rock Brooklyn to perform at the event, uh, wanting to give some uh, 
a cool opportunity to local musicians um, at their festival. So they'll be opening up the festival on Friday and Sunday, and we're thrilled to have some, uh, some excited folks to do that. Um, I'm gonna pass this part of the presentation over to Jennifer Stiles on our team. Uh, she is our head of festivals and is running everything uh, logistics for the event. Okay. You'll keep sharing. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I should unmute myself. Hello, good evening. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah, yeah? good, great. Okay, perfect. Um, so I wanted to talk through some of uh, the footprint and the usage of the park um, for this inaugural year in Flushing Meadow Corona Park. Um, we are working with the parks department um, and other city agencies, um, NYPD, FDNY, um, the city wide events management office, mayor's office, et cetera, um, to make sure that our impact for, to the park um, during this, this period is um, as positive as it can be. Um, what that means is we'll be building um, the festival in various stages. Um, we'll take over the park's uh, property in phased takeovers that will be coordinated um, through those agencies. Um, and we will uh, work to reduce the vehicle traffic in the park um, that does come along with building an event of this size. Next slide. Um, thank you. Uh, the area of the park that GovBall will take place in is what um, we refer to as the festival grounds um, and some area um, just above the Avenue of Commerce. Um, you'll see on this uh, graphic, there are three stages. Uh, the main stage is uh, presented by Verizon and that's a corporate sponsorship. Uh, the second stage is that blue stage um, in the corner on the right, the GoPuff stage, and then the Bacardi stage is that orangish reddish stage um, in the lower corner. Uh, festival patrons will be inside the entire footprint and roam around from stage to stage. They'll also visit um, sponsorship footprints, food vendors, um, beverage areas, etc. The festival entrance uh, will be adjacent to the Unisphere. Um, it was an entrance that was requested of us by the Parks Department and is the same entrance location as the Paul Simon concert, uh, if any of you um, attended that. Um, it's a wide open space and we are um, designing the queuing um, to go around the festival grounds um, on some of the, the, the roads within it. Um, so that uh, festival patron or non-festival patrons, park goers can still use areas outside of the festival footprint. Uh, the attendees to GovBall will come on subway, uh, the seven train or the LIRR train. Uh, the history of GovBall through its many years, as Tom reviewed, um, has always been a subway-based crowd. Um, we have not had parking at the festival um, through most of the festival's timeline. And so that's something that attendees are really used to uh, and function well with. Uh, the ride share program, uh, we work with Uber and Lyft to dedicate a, a geofence, um, a specific area when you open the app um, that will help folks to delineate exactly where they can or cannot be dropped off or picked up. Um, and that planning uh, will be coordinated with NYPD and City Field um, for the activities that are also in, at City Field. Um, we are staff impact, staff traffic, traffic and parking. Um, we will be using City Field uh, for some of our vehicle uh, vendor and staff parking. Again, um, just trying to minimize our impact on Flushing Meadow Corona Park and the parking that is um, for public use surrounding the park. Um, we will, you know, on days of show, we'll screen all of our vehicles that are coming in on the perimeter. Um, we work with NYPD um, for this screening effort and the traffic planning. Uh, we are also working with uh, the Queens Night Market, Queens Theater, Queens Museum um, in coordination for their their guests, um, Queens Night Market actually is participating in the festival and we are hosting some of their vendors inside the festival. Um, and then Queens Theater and Queens Museum, um, we are looking into working with them and using some of their internal spaces um, for office space, et cetera, on show days. Um, but all of those conversations around our load in and load out period um, are working to um, make sure that they can function as normal um, as they need to on those non-show days. 
Um, and that's really the top line details of the physical layout of the festival. Uh, Tom and I are happy to, oh, actually, no, sorry. We're gonna, you wanna go back to Tom? There's a couple more. Yeah. You wanna talk through that? There you go. Um, a couple more things about uh, Founders, uh, which you uh, probably don't know much about. Um, it's a, we're a smaller company. Um, as I mentioned, we're New York City born and bred. Um, and we rely fully um, on our track record and reputation. Um, we have a exceptional relationship with all of the city agencies. And that's because since 2011, we have run our events incredibly safely. Um, and have been very, very transparent as to all of our planning efforts. Um, we've always followed our word. Um, and I think there's a reason why the city uh, allowed us to be the first big event in the park uh, after many, many years. Uh, this means immediate action to any requests that come from the parks department or community boards or conversations from there. Uh, and of course, there's a great amount of respect both ways between us and then all of the city partners. Uh, uh, as mentioned, uh, we have tons of friends in the city um, working closely with MTA, METS, PD, FDNY, Parks, uh, Randall's Island Park Alliance. Uh, we had two successful years at City Field, so we work well with that team, um, the Department of Health, both on the local and the state level, um, and of course the mayor's office through multiple um, different uh, mayoral teams. Um, we live here, you know, we, we are New Yorkers. Uh, we always want to, to do our part. Um, and we really view GovBall as New York City's event. And we want to be here for many, many years to come. We'd love to be in a beautiful, iconic park for many years to come. And we're committed to doing whatever we need to do to, uh, to, to do that and have that option. Um, and, uh, you know, our efforts are, um, have been seen over the years by, by many electeds, uh, and also community board members. Um, so that is our deck. Uh, I'm sure there are many questions and we are here to answer um, any and all of them. Um, actually, before I pass it over for questions, I do want to mention that this is the first time we are appearing um, in front of community boards. We wanted to start at this meeting and then use this as a jumping off point to go to speak to other community boards, whether that's the general meeting or the parks meeting, um, whatever meetings we wanted to take feedback here. Um, and then we'd set uh, the appropriate time to, to speak at those community boards, whether that be this month or, or next month. Um, so I can uh, open up the floor for questions if that's the right format um, or whatever we think is best. Thank you, Tom. Um, so right off the back, you know, safety is gonna be key. Um, so just speak a little bit. I think um, you're muted. About... Oh, you hear me? Do you hear me? Hello, you hear me? I hear you, VP. We can hear you. Oh, sorry, sorry, my bad. No my problem. bad. No problem. So, um, yeah, so safety is going to be obviously of the highest priority. And I just wanted to hear a little bit about your strategy um, in terms of working with PD. Are you hiring private security as well? Um, so that that's the first question. And then, you know, I, I will, because I know we're going to continue to meet. So I won't hold you hostage in this meeting too much. Um, second question is on these opportunities that will arise, whether that's job opportunities, um, whether it's the affordability of the tickets, how is that being promoted to the general public? Uh, what is your strategy around that um, as well? So I will I'll, I know we'll meet offline and continue to have these hashes out. So, so I'll leave the floor open to um, more of the chairs to ask questions, but safety definitely the opportunities, you know, are there MWBE goals? How are you working with local restaurants as well uh, in terms of promoting their products or stores, you know, um, especially that are Queens owned. So we wanna make sure that as investment happens, you know, those restaurants, especially in close proximity to the site are, are will see a big benefit as well. Uh, so those will be my two questions and then we'll turn it over. Uh, to the, chair, the chairs if they have questions. Sure, um, I'll answer half of that uh, and I'll let Jen answer the other half. Um, as it relates to um, job opportunities and opportunities for things on site, um, we would certainly communicate that to all the community boards when we speak to people individually. Um, there are a number of positions that we would make available uh, to apply for. Um, and then we would encourage people to reach out to our vendor partners uh, as well, uh, which we would make that list available. Um, as it relates to food vendors and restaurants, 
Uh, primarily, our focus has been with the Queen's Night Market and uh, working with them to help curate our food lineup. Uh, we will be announcing that lineup very, very soon. Uh, we've been talking to John Wang for many, many months, um, and he has highlighted uh, a certain number of vendors that he feel would be perfect for the event uh, and can handle the volume um, and just the type of event that it is, because it is a little bit different than what he does. Um, so that's been our primary focus with local restaurants, but we are uh, open to ideas if there are other ways uh, to promote folks or restaurants that are not necessarily internal in the event, um, but uh, you know, people feel that uh, we should um, help promote or raise awareness for. Uh, we're easy and open. Um, we have a, a very active, engaged audience, uh, both on social media as well as email, um, and we can help uh, in a number of ways. Um, and maybe there's some bids that you can connect with. And then on the jobs piece, you know, would you be interested in, in doing some sort of job fair where people can come and maybe you're connecting, uh, I don't know, with some local CBLs where people can come in one day and find out what those opportunities look like? Yeah, um, we can. Uh, let me come back to you on that. Um, I want to connect with our different uh, vendor teams on the production operations end and get a better idea of what the positions are uh, so that we can come to those with specific uh, job requirements uh, and just uh, make sure that we have all the necessary information to make the best use of that time. But we can come back to you next week with that. MWBE opportunities as well. Um, um, and then I guess the last question I, I had was on the safety piece. So what are you thinking there? And I mean, I know you've been closely coordinating with NYPD, uh, but just speak to what that looks like. Is your volume down? Hi. Sorry, we're sitting next to each other, so take care about the echo. We have to coordinate. Um, I can speak to the safety piece. Um, so we do work closely with NYPD, um, both on the local precinct le level and borough-wide. Um, we've been in several planning meetings with NYPD. This is typical for us um, throughout the history of the festival. Um, we review uh, our screening processes for guests, staff, artists, crew, um, you know, what, what the search is like. We review prohibited items, allowed items. Um, we also review crowd control, crowd management, um, procedures, uh, show stop procedures in case we want to, you know, review some audience behavior, um, in the middle of a set. Um, all of those conversations have happened. They are ongoing and they will continue to develop until we are closer to show day. Um, we have a unified command um, internally at the festival um, that our uh, security teams run our CCTV and our dispatchers out of. Um, our dispatchers are in communication with all of our festival departments um, site-wide. And within that a unified command center. We do have representation from PD, FBI, uh, FDNY, um, our private medical team, OEM, uh, CECM, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that is where any um, important decision regarding um, show open, show close, weather, et cetera, is discussed and, and uh, outcomes are determined. Um, as far as uh, real-time management in, you know, both normal and emergency conditions, um, we typically the line between PD is they're supporting the perimeter of the festival and the pa the non-patron um, side. So that would be on the park side um, and they will come into the festival in the case of escalated emergency. Inside the festival, um, we deploy six different, typically six different um, security agencies that are licensed within the state and have the appropriate certifications, um, fire guard certs, et cetera. Um, the reason why we use six different uh, agencies uh, is because we try to get the, the best of every company. And so rather than having all 650 security guards from one company, we want the best 100 from six different companies. Um, we have a, a large team that manages those vendors. Um, we have a, a security director at the top, and then we have area managers underneath that. And so from a managerial level, from the festival side, um, you'll see that oversight, every area of the festival has a dedicated manager. Um, so it's something we take very seriously. Um, and I think it, our track record speaks for itself because of the, the seriousness that we, we apply here. Um, 
you know, moving into closer to the festival, we will have all of our final plans, um, our emergency operating plans, our emergency evacuation, uh, everything will be filed um, as appropriately with DOB um, and inspected um, by FDNY, TPA is all of those things. Um, and so that's part of our safety coordinated planning as well. Um, as well as like signage, um, we've been doing a lot of review of our signage, um, emergency and non-emergency signage. Um, that's all part of the circulation um, and crowd management plan. Okay. Uh, any questions? Well, y'all just all excited to go. <laughs> all right. We're going to go to Chair Orrin and have Yes. You know, I always have questions, sorry. So two questions, uh, and I may have missed it, and I apologize if I did. What are the hours of the festival each of the days, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday? Yeah, no, actually, you didn't mention it. That's a great question. Um, we didn't mention that we should have, so thank you for bringing that up. Uh, mm -hmm. The gates of the festival are at 1145 on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Okay. Um, that's when we open our gates and allow patrons to enter. Um, the music starts typically around 1215 on all of those mm -hmm. days. One day it's 1230. Um, and our curfew is 10 p.m. So operating hours are essentially 1145 until 10 p.m. Um, we will be show ready by... Um, 11 a.m. That's what we aim for. And that means all of our security in place, et cetera. And we don't open our gates until we have checked all of those boxes. Okay. So I was just wondering, um, for, with the Long Island Railroad, there is what's called a, a city, uh, city ticket, which costs $5 during non-peak. Have mm -hmm. you talked to them at all during uh, offering that for anyone traveling to the festi festival? Uh, mm -hmm for the entire time of the event? Because I'm just thinking in particular, like folks from Brooklyn, it's so easy for them to get on the railroad and get out there and discourage even Uber and Lyft if they can get on for $5. Yeah, absolutely. And we've done city tickets before. Um, we've worked with MTA in the past um, for a round trip ticket. So people buy the ticket when they're getting on and then it's a faster exit. Um, we're working with both MTA and LIRR on those processes right now. They're reviewing with their teams. Um, in fact, one of the things that came up during our last conversation was potentially bringing out mobile units. So there are even more uh, physical uh, units to buy those cards from. So there isn't um, as much congestion on the platform at the Willits Point okay. Station. Um, and right, so those conversations right. are ongoing. Yes. Great. Thank you. And Dolores, yeah, we're going to have some news on Rockaway City tickets. So. I, I can't even think about it. It makes me crazy. <laughs> so we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna have some good news soon. All right. We're going to go to Heather now. Just following up on the MTA and Long Island Railroad, um, I'm assuming that you're working with them on increased number of trains, both to and from, most specifically from, um, is that correct? Yes, increased trains and also discussing um, the side that the doors open on, on that particular platform, um, because we do have events. Um, there's a, our event and there's also the public park goers and then City Field also has a concert that night. Um, so we're coordinating between their timing, our timing, and how all the trains go into that. Um, saw you raise your eyebrow. Uh, eyebrows. The one thing I can say about the other event at City Field, it's been closely coordinated and the time in which our patrons arrive and leave um, is completely different times um, than that City Field event um, strategically. Um, they have a later door time and they have a later curfew. So we'll kind of enter in the GovBall people, enter in the City Field people, GovBall people will leave, and then City Field people will leave. Um, and all of those um, entities are in that same conversation to make sure that we're increasing trains and getting the, the doors on the right side, <laughs> the correct side. I shouldn't say the right side, the correct side. And then within Governor, within those three different um performance platforms that you have set up, are they all finishing at the same time or are those also going to be sort of staggered so that not everyone's leaving at the same time? 
Yes, exactly. They are staggered. Um, our main stage is the last stage to finish. Um, so when we release our set times, you'll see a lot of overlap throughout the day. And then usually around like 830 is when we start to focus on one stage. And so you'll see uh, most of our patron crowd movement moves into the main stage field um, and or is exiting starting at that time. And, and historically, we do start to see egress around 830. Not everyone comes for the headliner. Um, and then we see a lot of people that leave, you know, oh, they've got 10 minutes left. We're going to head to the train now. Thank you so very much. Yeah, no worries. Hey, any other questions? Wow. I see, yes, I see none. All right. Well, thank, thank you. you. We look forward uh, to working with you. I don't know if this, uh, CB3 is on. Well, several community boards that overlap. CB3 is not on. But I know they're going to have. So I would just suggest also um, definitely doing that direct outreach um, to the chair, Giovanni and Christian as well, um, sooner than later. And um, we look forward to working with y'all and figuring out because one of the things I want to see is more of a organic uh, more organic, more support for organic groups on the ground in these communities, I want to say. So like, I appreciate, you know, make a wish and these are the great organization, take nothing from them, but there are definitely some organizations on the ground in these communities doing great work. And um, so we look forward to having some more uh, conversation with you on that. I'm going to go to Paul now for questions. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Borough President Richards. I just wanted to ask, is, is there a way that we can uh, reach directly to the founders group if, if need be for questions? Uh, yes, uh, we yes, can, we can share, share our uh, contact info with everybody. Uh, Khalil, actually, if, if you wouldn't mind sending that out to, uh, to everyone, um, feel free to reach out to us at any point whatsoever. Um, we'll also schedule to be in this meeting after the festival uh, for any uh, recap notes, thoughts, um, you know, improvements are, are something that we always want to make every year, especially being in this venue for the first time. Uh, so don't hesitate to reach out and we'll certainly be back. And Tom, if you yeah. can send that uh, deck, I'll, I'll send that along with the contact information, the presentation deck. Right. And then I just want to add just on the ticket piece, um, you know, we need to get the word out because I'm sure tickets are going to go fast as we get closer. So that community piece is critical in getting that information out. I don't know if there's some graphic or something folks will be able to share for those community boards, but definitely um, getting the word out about those low cost tickets also is it's important. For sure, we can put together a graphic really quickly. Um, you know, the text we have already, it's already on our, our website, but we can put together a graphic and have it sent out to all the community boards uh, this week, just so we can get out to, to everyone. Uh, it's a 15% discount across any ticket type. Uh, there's no cap on those, so oh, great. Um, uh, you know, how much are those tickets? Fifteen, you said. Fifteen percent. Fifteen percent off. Yeah. Nice. Okay. I, I thought you said fifteen dollars for a second. I was about to say, ooh. Um, and and uh, uh, Tom, I, I just want, and I also, to thank you. right. And I, I just also want to add schools. So you got high schools. You have so there needs to be like a student ticket because these kids are not going to be able to come up with that. So we should really think about that as well since it's in their backyard and they'll be excited i'm sure i was just in one of the schools over there and i'm like talking about we would do like a civic engagement piece <laughs> we created the civics in the classroom program so i'm talking about yeah you know nas and they're like little nas x what you talking about they didn't even know who nas was i'm like i am really old now like thanks for dating me guys you know <laughs> like, like, you're like no little nas x you mean they didn't even know who Nas was. That's said dead. <laughs> Here it is. I think I'm young in him. Those we, um, we welcome any and all feedback and we welcome recommendations of organizations that we should talk to and work with. Yep. Um, you know, Shia and ECRC are ones that we heard about just from asking around. Uh, if there are other organizations, whether they're high school organizations, collegiate, others, uh, you know, we'd love to talk with them and figure out how to work with them, if not this year in the future. Um, you know, we definitely want to to give like this year, opportunity to, to be highlighted. I like, this, I like this year. All right. And um, just Tom, I wanted just to thank you for creating it in the first place for having that kind of passion to do something like this uh, with your partners. I looked up the group, a founders group 
and it's a it's an amazing festival and it, it really raises the cultural uh you know vibrancy of new york city thank you this is a big one for queen it's a big one for queen betty oh betty oh okay which artist are you about to talk about shout out it's great to be back with us today get well soon Betty. betty's lobbying for kendrick lamar i guess all right got it. all right <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, well, thank you all um, for coming. Uh, when is the, yeah, hey, y'all close it out. When is the next one of these meetings? Because I don't know what I did with my paper. May 3rd, I think it is. Next borough board meeting. Come May 1st, May 1st. May 1st, okay. So thank you all. This is really an informative one. I uh, appreciate it. Look forward to uh, seeing y'all. Have a blessed Easter, Passover. And happy birthday to you. Yeah, happy and birthday. <laughs> My wow. birthday's on Easter this year and my wow. wedding anniversary because I got married on my birthday. So it's three, three, three in one pack. <laughs> wow. Happy, birthday. Happy, birthday. Happy, birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you. God bless you all. Stay safe.